In preparation for the readings, let us pray together the prayer for illumination. God, as we review your promises, may the old become new, those who are lost be found, and the exhausted be refreshed. Amen. The Old Testament scripture reading is taken from Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 4a. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And the epistle lesson is from Romans 4, verses 1 to 5, 13 to 17. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now to one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trusts him, who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. The Gospel reading is from John, chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you of it. You must be born from 
but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Let us join our voices in singing the hymn, Jesus, Lover of My Soul, number 676.
the great declaration. God, give us a clear vision of the truth, faith in your power, and confident assurance of your love. Amen. If you had any childhood association at all with Sunday school, it is more than likely you would have recited and perhaps memorized the words of John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. These words have been described as the greatest of all declarations. They have also been called the gospel in miniature. But the words may not be as plain now as they were when we were children, because it is hard to believe that anyone could love the world in the miserable state it is in now. Yet it is hard to ignore the feeling that the statement speaks to us, rooted as we are in our very basic childhood and Sunday school beliefs. So we want to more, know more precisely what it says to us, not to the first believers of 2,000 years ago, but what it says to all of us today. As for the statement itself, of course, it's in the third chapter of John's Gospel, at the end of a fascinating interview between Jesus and the rich young Nicodemus, an individual looking for something that seemed to be missing in his life. It is intriguing to learn that many students of the Gospels believe that all of this was recorded, written down many years after the time of Jesus and the disciples. Of course, we have the oral tradition when so much that's in the Bible was spoken from one generation to another, and finally it was written down in some form. So what John is saying is a summary of something that happened many years before. So the meaning of Christ was there after all of this had happened. And John wanted to give the picture after it had been totally absorbed. John, who saw that whole drama from the very beginning to end and wanted to tell the world what it meant. John, it is said, uses words as an artist uses colors. So he tells about God as the father of a son. In another place, he speaks of God as a spirit. And in one of his letters, that God is love. And yet again, yet again, he says that uh, no one has seen God at any time. I think of the word metaphor. I had spent many years reading the scriptures and preaching on them before I really absorbed the meaning of metaphor. That's a good word because some things can only be spoken about and thought about in pictures. John sees the world as a community of human beings who get extremely tangled. 
who go so mightily wrong. Yet John encountered the Jesus whose connection in a various, in a very mysterious, hard to understand, a connection with God, a connection so intimate that, that God lived in him. And he described this in terms of a relationship between a father and a son. The world we live in, with all of its horrors and tragedies, messed up lives, this world is the object of God's love. And God loves it as a parent loves a wayward, estranged child. In spite of everything, the parent goes on loving. In other words, I bid you to see Jesus, in whom the grace of God was present. And God, that is the grace of God, is still present and doing something in the world. Sometimes in what may seem like minor ways, we think of the terrible state that the world is in, many corners of the world, untold cruelty and suffering, and it makes us wonder. Now I want to tell you a story, this time not from my childhood, a story from the day before yesterday. I like to drop over to the track. It's not what it used to be. <laughs> Unfortunately, for some of us, we think we were born either 50 years too soon or 50 years too late, I'm not sure which. But as you know, many of the things that were part of our lives are fading away. I think of the old days of a six-team National Hockey League. Life seemed simpler then. I think of a day when a television set had an on and off button and that was all. It was very simple as you tuned into your two or three stations. Many things have changed and so it is that I drop over to the track which soon will no longer be a racetrack, but did you know that there are still 10 or 12 horses stabled there? And a trainer by the name of Sheldon Watts has been a friend of mine for some time. Maybe some of you know him. So I drop over every once in a while. Sheldon gets up at five o'clock in the morning to go over and tend to the horses. I did not arrive that early. But I went over and I parked by the Capitol Winter Club. There's an open gate there. I made it to the gate and then I looked out on what I suppose was 50 feet of sheer ice and me with my cane. And I pondered, how can I make it over that ice without falling on my head? And at that moment, someone over by a stable door asked me if I needed help. Charlie Miles, who works at the track, Charlie dropped what he was doing, came over and took me by the arm and helped me over that 50-foot expanse of ice so that I would not fall. And then, after a lengthy visit with Sheldon, there was on my mind how to get back to my car. Sheldon said, well, there's a vehicle here. I think I know who it belongs to. So he went out and spoke to Brian Embleton. Brian's been around the track and the exhibition grounds for a good many years. And Brian put me in his truck and drove out uh, another entrance to the uh, exhibition grounds onto Saunders Street, drove me over to uh, Rookwood and up Rookwood and into the Winter Club parking lot to my car. Now, why do I mention 
These seem like small things, but it's good turns like that that give us uh, glimpses, just a gleam of goodness, some goodness that still exists in this seemingly dark, discouraging world. And I know things like that happen hundreds of times, even in this city, day by day. So as you think of the state of the world, as you think even of some of the rotten things that go on around you, there is still that gleam of goodness that gives us some hope for this world. And perhaps you have been on the receiving end. And I know that many of you have been on the giving end. And I know that in this church, that that is a, a sign of hope, that there is something that is happening in this world, and maybe even happening in this church family, to lift you out of what you may think is a low place, something happening to untangle some of the knots. It's hard to put it into adequate words, what we see happening around us, the bad and yet glimpses of the good, except to go back to the gospel. As John said it, God so loved the world, that's you and that's me, that he gave his only son that whosoever believe, believeth on him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Let us pray. A prayer from Dr. Theodore Ferris, who I've quoted before, from Boston's Trinity Church. The prayer, open our hearts and minds, O God, to the truth that we find in words written long ago. Help us to find the very depths of their meaning and take them into our lives. And as we look at a world that is sick and torn, help us to see it as the object of your love, a love that is shown by people just like us. Amen.